Mr. President, distinguished guests, dear friends, members of the World Economic Forum. It is a very special honor to welcome you all to this first World Economic Forum Strategic Dialogue on the future of the South Caucasus and Central Asia. Allow me to thank you, Mr. President Aliyev, and the government of Azerbaijan personally for kindly hosting us here today in the beautiful city of Baku. And if I may add a personal remark, it's exactly 20 years ago that I have been here the last time, and I'm so impressed by the progress and I have to say the beauty of the city of Baku today. It's a honor for the World Economic Forum to organize this meeting in Azerbaijan given the country's unique place in the region. Azerbaijan in many ways represents a microcosm of the region's great opportunities. The country has witnessed impressive growth rates in recent years thanks to responsible exploitation of its ex exceptional resource potential. At the same time, it has shown a unique will and skill in using these valuable resources to support the diversification of the country's economy through very wise reforms. Today, Azerbaijan leads the way in the financial sector, in information technology, in construction, and is an increasingly part of what has been called the new Silk Road. Yet we should remember that no country in the region, be it Azerbaijan or its leading regional partners, can realize the full potential on its own. The region has many riches to tap into in order to ensure its long-term economic success. These are not lim limited to natural resources only, they range from a unique geographical position to a highly educated workforce and an innovative spirit. This potential be best exploited by coming together and working together. Many regions across the world, be it the European continent or more recently the ASEAN region, have come to the realization that economic, social, and political gains are to be had from uniting their complementary strengths in a spirit of trust and long-term cooperation. This is why the World Economic Forum is initiating, it's not just organizing this meeting, but initiating a long-term new initiatives, the scenarios for the South Caucasus and Central Asia. This process will fully develop over the coming 18 months and will engage a broad set of regional and international stakeholders of the region and beyond in a strategic reflection on prospects of regional economic integration. It will devise scenarios for the region's long-term future to help us think creatively and robustly about the region's unique evolution potential. Today, we will start this process and we will explore critical themes for this pro prospects, energy, and resources, natural resources, trade and supply change, entrepreneurship and human capital, finance and long-term investing. 
Throughout the day, we have a chance to identify the region's unique opportunities in each of those four areas, as well as to think of the innovative steps that can be taken to further realize these opportunities in the coming years. I look forward to hearing about some of your insights and engaging you in discussions with our exceptional panel speakers here today. Let me just introduce to you our panel speakers of this opening session. Mr. André Kostin, Chairman and Chief Executive of VTB Bank Russian Federation. His Excellency, Mr. Otobayev, the first Vice Prime Minister of the Kyrgyz Republic. Mr. Sankintayev, the first Deputy Prime Minister of Kazakhstan. His Excellency, Tanner Yildiz, the Minister of Energy and Natural Resources of Turkey. Before hearing from each of you your views, dear panelists, we will now view a, few, a brief briefing, video providing context around some of today's discussion, and I will, in a, will invite some participants to vote on their on three possible alterna alternatives representing possible futures for the region's economy. As you see, we will conduct the meeting today in a very interactive way. Based on his long-standing experience of the region's unique opportunities, Mr. Frederick Starr, whom I would like to thank for joining us today, will provide us with his impressions on the region's long-term potential in reaction to these voting results. I will then invite President Aliyev to share his views on the future of Azerbaijan, the South Caucasus and Central Asia as an introduction to our discussions today, which I trust will be fruitful. Mr. President, I also want to use this opportunity to thank you particularly for your friendship and your partnership with the World Economic Forum. Having attended for seven uninterrupted years at our annual meeting, I think you have contributed substantially to place Azerbaijan and this region on the international map and to show to the global political and economic community what this region can contribute to world prosperity and possibly world cooperation and peace. I now hope that you will enjoy today's discussions. I welcome you again very cordially and now we will have an opportunity to look first at the video. Europe is the world's largest trading bloc. Asia is fast coming together and driving the global economy forward. Could an integrated Central Asia and South Caucasus connect these centers of growth to become the world economy's new Silk Road and latest frontier opportunity? The region's history as a trading route dates back to a rich cultural heritage. Today, rail transport from China to Europe is 70% cheaper and emits over 90% less carbon than air freight. Over half of businesses state that improving public infrastructure is a critical priority for development in the region. And it's estimated that regional integration could result in a 100% increase in GDP per capita in just 10 years, thereby benefiting the region's valuable human capital. The region is full of untapped potential. Azerbaijan's production of natural gas has grown over 200% in eight years. Kazakhstan's Kashgan field is estimated to be one of the world's six largest untapped oil fields. 
and Turkmenistan has the fourth largest natural gas reserves in the world. Ever-increasing financial windfalls are providing the region with the opportunity to get onto the right track. Foreign direct investment increased ninefold between 2000 and 2009, and several countries are building capital reserves that could support long-term investment for the region's future. But much work needs to be done to establish the region as tomorrow's next frontier of growth and development. What can we do about it? Do you believe you have the possibility to vote now? Do you believe that the region's future will be most likely first more integrated, second more fragmented, and third more polarized? Please push your device. We will see the results in a moment. Mr. President, and uh, I think it's a very good, <laughs> it's a very good result. Uh, and as we know, I think beliefs very much shape also realities. In now, uh, Professor Starr, would you would you comment on those uh, on those results, please? Very positive. What does what does integration or coordination, maybe more appropriate term, actually mean? Well, we know from the energy sector in this miraculous 15 years uh, what it means. Uh, it's energy going in every direction. From, from Central Asia, from the Caspian, from the Caucasus, from this spot. Uh, but there's another factor emerging that may be in the future uh, at least as bigger, bigger, and that is trade and transport. And this is, this is something that seems to me absolutely worth watching, not local transport. It's not just melons from here to Georgia and pomegranates from Georgia to here. It is, it is continental trade from Hamburg to Hanoi, through the Caucasus, through Azerbaijan, through Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, so forth, all the way to China and also across Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, uh, uh, and to India. So this is, this is something which is coming, but it's also been here in the past. A thousand years ago, currency from this region, silver dirhams, were the absolute currency of choice from Sweden to Sri Lanka. So, so that it was closed off for many hundreds of years, and the Soviet borders prevented this interaction, this integration. But now, now this is open. China moved quickly after 91 to open with, the, with Europe a direct transport. And now since 2001, it's been possible also to add the direct routes to India, thanks to the opening in Afghanistan. So something very big is happening. This region right here is turning into a kind of land Suez, linking, linking parts of the continent. And, and uh, it, this, is, this is already not a dream, but a fact. There is over $40 billion of investments that have been made already in this, just the southern corridor. And that means a new railroad across the belt of India. It means right here, uh, it means uh, new railroads north, south, east, west, 
new, new roads, uh, new pipelines, uh, new port on, uh, just south of here. Similarly in Turkmenistan, all this is going on. Huge investments are already being made. So the question isn't whether this is going to happen, but exactly when and how. The obvious conclusion is that if you want to play a part in it in the future, the time to move is now. Thank you, Professor Starr. I think we should now, with great pleasure, listen to President Aliyev, and who will share his views on the future of the region. But before doing so, I would also like to acknowledge in the audience the participation of uh, distinguished heads of states and uh, prime ministers, uh, not only from the region, but I should say interested into the region. President Aliyev, the floor is yours. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, like to greet you all in Azerbaijan and express my gratitude for participating at this remarkable event. I'd like especially to express my gratitude to Professor Schwab for accepting our invitation to host World Economic Forum in Baku and for all the support our country gets from uh, participating at the World Economic Forum. As Professor Schwab underlined, I participated already seven times, and I can tell that this participation and participation at the discussions and uh, communications with the uh, uh, business elite of the world helped us a lot to diversify our economy. Because our economy um, development started with energy sector, and still energy sector is the most at attractive for foreign investments, but our main objective now is to diversify the economy. And in order to do it, we need to present ourselves to the world business community, not only as a country with important uh, geographical location and natural resources, but also as a country which is committed to reforms, committed to transformation, and to diversification. And I can tell you that uh, the opportunities which World Economic Forum provides at uh, Davos meetings uh, helped us to develop relationship with uh, companies which had no idea about Azerbaijan in the past. Our country is relatively young. Uh, we only have 21 years of independence, but Azerbaijan is a country of great history, traditions, culture, I'm sure our guests will have a chance also to know more about Azerbaijan. But as an independent country, we live only 21 years. And uh, Professor Schwab uh, mentions that his first visit to Azerbaijan was March 93. Maybe that was the most difficult time for our young independent nation. Our independence had only uh, less than two years of experience. And the situation in Azerbaijan at that time, I think, was the worst in post-Soviet area. We had uh, internal clashes. That was a time of civil war. That was a time of uh, war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and uh, which ended in occupation of 20% of our internationally recognized territories. And actually, 93 was a turning point for development because after mid-93, the situation started to stabilize. We started to implement very serious and radical political and economic reforms, and Azerbaijan started to present itself to international community. That was the beginning of transformation from planned economy to market economy, from one-party system to multi-party system, from totalitarianism to democracy. And I can tell you that uh, 20 years, of course, is not a very big period from a historical point of view, but at the same time, this period was a real period of transformation. Azerbaijan managed in the beginning of its reforms to attract major investments to energy sector, and uh, we are grateful to investors, to big energy companies, 
for investing in Azerbaijan. We uh, managed at a later stage to transform uh, direction of economic development from energy to non-energy sector and to attract investments in the uh, sectors which are not related to oil and gas. And at the same time, we continued with uh, economic and political reforms, and this process is continuing now. And um, that will create uh, good opportunities for sustainable development of Azerbaijan in the coming years. We have a very advantageous geographical location, but without infrastructure, this location doesn't mean a lot. We have natural resources, and we have built already diversified transportation network for our hydrocarbons. Because Azerbaijan is a landlocked country, therefore in order to export our oil and gas, we needed to build pipelines. And uh, I think that was the biggest challenge in the end of 90s, the beginning of uh, this century, and uh, that challenge uh, was uh, successfully met. Today we have a diversified network of pipelines, seven oil and gas pipelines, which transport Azerbaijani oil and gas to international and European markets. At the same time, Azerbaijan has already started to play a transit role for our partners across the Caspian with respect to transportation of hydrocarbons. But our main target uh, since uh, last 10 years was diversification of economy. And if you look at the economic development of Azerbaijan, we'll see that uh, our economy was one of the fastest growing economies in the world for the last 10 years. GDP grew three times, 300%. Industrial production, 2.5 times. Uh, we managed to reduce unemployment. Uh, now the level of unemployment is 5.2%. Uh, ten years ago, almost half of our population lived in poverty. Now, poverty level is 6%. And uh, budget spendings grew almost 20 times. And uh, inflation is around 1%. And so these are the developments of the last ten years. And we are also very glad to see the uh, reflection of our achievements in the assessment of World Economic Forum, because World Economic Forum ranks Azerbaijan number 46 with respect to competitiveness of the economy, and number one, the fourth consecutive year, number one in uh, CIS. At the same time, even during the times of economic and financial crisis, our economy still was growing. Even when the oil prices dropped um, uh, to a very substantial level, our economy still was growing because already non-energy sector started to produce good results. And all the major credit uh, rating agencies, Fitch, S&P, and Moody's, upgraded Azerbaijan's credit ratings recently, which is also a good indication of the reforms. We are now uh, transforming the oil wealth into human capital. And one of the main targets for the future is education. Education is the most important uh, factor for any successful development of any country. And investments to education, the context between our universities and the leading universities of the world, uh, allow us to um, plan our economic future based on a very uh, you know, intelligent human capital. At the same time, we are now investing in the new technologies and ICT sector becomes one of the priorities in Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan already became a uh, member of the restricted club of the countries with space industry. This February, first our satellite, Azer Space One, was launched successfully. And this is only the beginning of the development of the space industry in Azerbaijan. So these uh, years of independence were the years of transformation, not only of political system and economic system, but also the years of active investments in the areas which uh, will generate wealth 
in the years to come. And the investment climate, to create a positive investment climate was one of the priorities in the beginning of our reforms. And uh, for the last 10 years, we uh, got uh, more than $130 billion of investments. And uh, part of that investments are foreign investments. Uh, good investment climate, predictable political situation, stable situation uh, in the country, and of course, uh, regional connections. So these are the main prerequisites for success for any country. Today, one of the topics which we'll address, of course, is the regional cooperation, integration. And uh, I'm very glad to see the results. By the way, I expected something like that because Azerbaijan uh, plays its role in regional cooperation. The projects which we've started in mid-90s were aimed not only at, at the economic development of Azerbaijan, but also at the broad regional cooperation. We're the first country which opened the Caspian Sea for foreign investments. We are the first country to uh, build a corridor from Caspian to Mediterranean and from Caspian to Black Sea. Those uh, oil and gas corridors uh, then started to uh, play its role as a general geopolitical uh, and transportation corridors. We are now finalizing the implementation of the, one of the most important projects, which is railroad connection between Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey. And that will not be a regional project, as our friend Mr. Stars uh, mentioned that will be the project which will connect Europe and Asia through Azerbaijan and through the neighboring countries. And I am very proud that we played uh, one of the most important role in implementing this project, not only with our financial resources, but also with our commitments and uh, political will was shown in order to implement this project. And of course, energy factors which as far as our government is concerned, is not a main priority any longer, but our energy potential plays and will play more important role for energy security of the region and particularly energy security of Europe. And two years ago, uh, we signed with the European Union the strategic partnership memorandum on energy, which is uh, now being implemented. And one of the most remarkable developments of the last uh, period was uh, agreement on the project called TANAP, Trans-Anatolian Pipeline. The idea was generated by Azerbaijan and supported strongly by our partners in Turkey and Georgia. And Azerbaijan has undertaken the major financial commitment in order to implement this project and to build another corridor for at least, at least, 100 years, because taking into account the huge gas reserves of Azerbaijan and potential reserves in the region, this corridor can play its role for decades to come. And of course, uh, regional cooperation uh, can be achieved only in a politically stable and uh, developing countries. We will talk today about transportation routes, about cooperation, integration, and it is possible only when all the countries involved have uh, the same attitude to this process. And I'm glad that the region of Caspian, Central Asia, and Azerbaijan, and uh, here in the region, we see the future in close ties, in cooperation, integration, unification of our efforts in order to provide better life for our people and better future for our countries. Once again, Dear friends, I'd like to welcome you to our country. Once again, express my gratitude to Professor Schwab and his team for holding this conference and this forum in Baku. And I'm sure that the results of this event will have a very serious um, implications on our day-to-day -day life. And the region will be more stable, more predictable, and more prosperous. Thank you very much. Mr. President, thank you very much for presenting to us 
uh, those I, I should uh, really say those success stories and this success didn't happen by itself, it happened through a very integrated, wise, forward-looking um, uh, vision and uh, the necessary policies to implement the vision. I have now the uh, pleasure and honor to call on the uh, uh, first Deputy Prime Minister um, of Kazakhstan to make his remarks. Уважаемый господин президент, господин председатель, уважаемые дамы и господа, прежде всего хотел поблагодарить Всемирный экономический форум за приглашение на такую представительную встречу. Центральная Азия и Кавказ – важный геостратегический регион Евразии. Находясь в центре континента, он выполняет важнейшую связующую экономическую роль на этом обширном пространстве. Поэтому растущий интерес в мире к его перспективам вполне закономерен. Надеемся, что сегодняшняя дискуссия станет практическим шагом к поиску новых возможностей и активизации сотрудничества между нашими странами. Прежде всего, хотел бы охарактеризовать современную экономическую ситуацию в Казахстане. За прошедшее десятилетие Казахстан сумел удвоить свой экономический потенциал. В абсолютном выражении ВВП страны вырос с 18 миллиардов долларов США в 2000 году до 200 миллиардов по итогам 2012 года. ВВП на душу населения за указанный период возрос с 1200 долларов США до 12 тысяч долларов в 2012 году. По прогнозам к 2020 году данный показатель превысит 20 тысяч долларов США. Нам удалось сохранить макроэкономическую стабильность в условиях мирового финансового кризиса и непростой экономической ситуации в ряде ведущих стран мира. В 2012 году рост экономики составил 5%. Уровень безработицы, безработицы сохраняется в последние годы на стабильном уровне, не превышающем 5,5%. По оценке специалистов, Казахстан является одним из наиболее привлекательных для инвестиций стран СНГ. С 1993 -го года привлечено более 160 миллиардов долларов США прямых иностранных инвестиций. По оценкам на долю Казахстана приходится около 80% прямых иностранных инвестиций, Центральноазиатского региона. Укрепляется финансовый потенциал Казахстана. Международные резервы, включая средства национального фонда, превысили 87 миллиардов долларов США. Об успехах страны также свидетельствует рейтинг Всемирного экономического форума, по которому Казахстан занял 51 место в глобальном индексе конкурентоспособности, переместившись за год на 21 позицию в группу стран с более высоким уровнем развития. Новый этап мирового развития, связанный с инновациями, новейшими знаниями и технологиями, требует модернизации экономического фундамента страны. В этой связи с 2010 года реализуется государственная программа форсированного индустриально-инновационного развития, направленная на масштабную диверсификацию отечественной экономики. На сегодня запланирована реализация более 770 проектов с созданием более 200 тысяч рабочих мест. За три прошедших года уже введено в действие более 530 предприятий, позволивших наладить выпуск абсолютно новых производств в стране, модернизировать инфраструктуру. Для поддержки программы функционируют 9 свободно-экономических зон, технопарки, индустриальные парки, предусмотрены различные финансовые и нефинансовые меры поддержки бизнеса. В этой связи приглашаем государство региона к сотрудничеству и кооперации между нашими компаниями и предприятиями. С учетом стратегической задачи, поставленной президентом Назарбаевым по вхождению Казахстана в тридцатку развитых стран мира к 2050 году, начинается работа по модернизации и трансформации экономики Казахстана к параметрам, характерным для этой группы стран, к стандартам лучшей международной практики. Первым практическим шагом станет переход к принципам зеленой экономики. Устойчивое развитие невозможно без бережного отношения к окружающей среде и природным ресурсам. Поэтому не случайен выбор Астаны местом проведения международной выставки «Экспо-2017», основной тематикой которой определена – энергия будущего. Это позволит привлечь передовые мировые технологии и зеленые решения в экономику нашей страны. Переходя ко второй части своего выступления, я хотел бы остановиться на некоторых перспективных направлениях сотрудничества со странами Центральной Азии и Кавказа. 
По ряду направлений уже наметились определенные заделы, но в целом остается еще значительный потенциал для расширения взаимодействия и реализации деловых инициатив. Во-первых, учитывая географическое расположение, на стыке Европы и Азии имеется значительный транспортно-логистический потенциал. Издревле наш регион лежал на историческом шелковом пути с востока на запад. Именно по этой территории на протяжении столетий проходили стратегически важные грузы из Китая и Индии в Европу. Поэтому Казахстан серьезно активизировал работу по восстановлению прежних транзитных функций моста между востоком и западом. В этих целях реализуется ряд важных проектов по направлению запад, восток, север, юг. Это трансконтинентальные проекты, которые открывают для Казахстана и других государств Центральной Азии Кавказа, не имеющих выхода к морю и расположенных в удалении от международных рынков новые возможности для роста торговли и экономического взаимообмена. В частности, мы осуществляем строительство международной автомагистрали Западной Европы, Западный Китай. На востоке страны реализуется проект Харгос Восточные ворота, направленный на повышение торговых связей с быстро растущим регионом Юго-Восточной Азии, а также Китая. На Каспии на базе порта Ахтау реализуется проект Западные ворота Казахстана. Реализацией таких проектов многие географические барьеры могут быть решены. Это большое поле для совместной деятельности стран региона. Во-вторых, огромный потенциал имеется в сельскохозяйственном секторе. На сегодня Казахстан является одним из важных зерновых центров мира и вторым в мире экспортером муки. С учетом наблюдающихся глобальных демографических процессов и структуры населения в Казахстане уже предприняты системные шаги по расширению продовольственной базы. В рамках программы развития АПК до 2020 года запланированы меры по увеличению производства экологически чистой хозяйственной продукции. На эти цели запланировано более 27 миллиардов долларов США до 2020 года. Казахстан также готов к самой тесной кооперации по этому направлению. В-третьих, недостаточно реализованным остается потенциал в сфере торговли. Так, товарооборот с государствами Центральной Азии и Кавказа в 2012 году по оценкам составил 4,7 миллиардов долларов США увеличившись по сравнению с 2011 годом на 27%. Но это составляет всего 4,2% от внешнеторгового оборота Казахстана в целом. При этом торговля со странами Кавказа составляет всего лишь 0,4% от общего внешнего торгового оборота страны. Как видим, потенциал большой. Можно активизировать обмен торговыми миссиями, проведение региональных бизнес-форумов, выработку межправительственных решений. В целом, с учетом сказанного, имеется значительный потенциал и общие интересы, поэтому нам есть над чем подумать. Отдельно хотел бы проинформировать вас, что 22 мая в Казахстане состоится очередной 6-й Ассанинский экономический форум. Целью его проведения является поиск решений на актуальные международные и региональные проблемы, с, которым, с которыми сталкиваются многие государства мира. Ключевым событием 6-го Ассанинского форума станет Всемирный, Всемирная антикризисная конференция под эгидой ООН. Пользуясь случаем, имеем честь пригласить всех участников сегодняшней встречи на Астанинский экономический форум. В завершение хотел бы пожелать превосходно организованного Бакинского форума платформной работы. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you. I now call on my friend uh, Kostin uh, to comment on <coughs> the situation and I would say as a neighbor and part of the region. Thank you very much, Professor Schwab. Ladies and gentlemen, I think as the one of the leading integration group, European Union is sinking deeper and deeper into the troubled waters of economic and financial crisis, the more we're looking and the global business is looking for more opportunities and for the new areas of economic growth. And definitely South Caucasus and Central Asia region represent one of such area. As Mr. President Alif mentioned, Over the last 10 years, uh, Azerbaijan, for example, uh, achieved a remarkable growth. And um, the result of economic um, development of Azerbaijan is extremely impressive. 
I think Mr. President gave a very interesting picture and comprehensive picture of this growth. I would like to congratulate him on such a great achievements during his uh, tenure as a president. But also, there's other countries, as my colleague from Kazakhstan just mentioned, who are doing extremely well, and of course, to a very big extent, uh, to the fact that those countries in the region who possess uh, a quite a rich uh, gas and oil resources and other mineral resources, of course, they might be doing uh, maybe better than other countries in the region. Though I think we all understand that the era of gas and oil is not forever, we all should be prepared for a much more competitive market from other countries which uh, might offer some alternative uh, sources of energy. Uh, of course, the region represents, as I, as I mentioned, one of the greatest opportunities for the growth. But I also would like to mention that, of course, the, one of the greatest challenges for the region, I think there's uh, security issues. Uh, of course, the region is uh, very complicated from political uh, and military point of view. Uh, you know, there's uh, neighboring countries like Afghanistan, like Iran. Uh, there is a threat of terrorism. There is a threat of Islamic radicalism. There is a problem of drug trafficking. Uh, there is um, a problem of political stability and transition of power in many countries of the region which pose this uh, security risk for the region. And I think this one should be uh, tackled very seriously if we want uh, or if we'd like to have a much uh, more prosperous uh, region. But there's also the area of uh, mutual cooperation. I would like just to mention some of the areas. Uh, one of them is uh, coordination uh, of the energy exporters' uh, strategies. As I mentioned, that uh, each country is trying to benefit from uh, oil proceeds, and Azerbaijan, I think, is, is doing extremely well and have a very practical approach to this issue. But also to rationalize the policy of energy export um, among the countries uh, of region, I think one of the uh, important tasks. The second, as my colleague already mentioned here, is the uh, transport logistic and uh, to create really the global transport corridors which will give a, an extremely uh, big boost to the economies uh, of the regions. And also, I think the inter-region um, uh, cooperation on trade and um, uh, investment. My colleague from Kazakhstan mentioned the figure on, on uh, Kazakhstan. I can say that for Russia, uh, the region represents only 5% uh, of the uh, foreign trade, and most of this, mo more than half of this, uh, actually represent our trade with Kazakhstan. Definitely that is not the level which Russia, for example, would like uh, to see. Um, the Russian role. Russia is not trying to recreate the empire as probably some of my American colleagues uh, would like to pause it. Uh, we think that uh, it is impossible. Uh, never in Russia can seriously uh, speak uh, about this nowadays. But of course, the country of the region, which we are discussing now, they all were part uh, of the Soviet Union uh, only 20 years ago. And uh, Russia definitely has a, a vested interest in the region for a number of reasons. We are of course, have the problem of radical uh, Islamic radicalism, where the problem of uh, drug trafficking coming either from the region or through the region from Afghanistan. Uh, we have other problems which directly affect uh, Russian security and Russian st stability. <laughs> so definitely that represents uh, a Caspian Sea. That's another example when Russia has a direct vested interest uh, in the region. Uh, but also, uh, we think that we can all benefit from closer cooperation. As I mentioned, the Russian, uh, under the Soviet Union, that was a, a one economy, and though over the 20 years many things changed, I think there's a still a lot of possibility for industrial cooperation, for economic cooperation, and cooperation in many other areas uh, in the region. That's why we are offering a different kind uh, of possibilities. 
uh, our approach is that um, integration uh, with the countries uh, of the region uh, might have a multi-speed approach. With some countries like Kazakhstan, for example, we already joined the custom union and we are moving toward the common economic space. Other countries we can offer a different, maybe softer uh, kind of cooperation, uh, starting from the lower uh, or maybe smaller cooperation, moving into a next stage, maybe at a different speed. But uh, we very much believe that such cooperation is needed. Again, we don't think that Russia poses any threat to the uh, economic or political independence of the countries. And though we understand the cooperation and integration is difficult because of the different level uh, of the development of the countries, because um, you know, of, of the nature of the economies, we still believe that the region will benefit from cooperation both economically and not least uh, important political from the point of political and security stability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Andre. Um, now I ask uh, Deputy First Deputy Prime Minister Otto Bayev from the Kyrgyz Republic to address us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Professor Schwab, thank you very much for excellent organization of this meeting. Especially, uh, I'm very much impressed by development of our brother country of Azerbaijan. To my shame, it is my first trip to Baku, Azerbaijan, and I was very much impressed what happening here. Uh, Mr. President, you personal role in this development cannot be overestimated. It's not only architecture or environmental projects which in this country. Yesterday I had opportunity to speak to simple people in the streets, to young people, to students, and there you see energy, there you see optimism, and there you can absorb what kind of energy this growing nation has. This is, gives us a lot of persuasion, and we are proud that our brother country is doing these things. Uh, we have uh, participating in the unique forum. Of course, uh, Kyrgyz Republic participating in this forum and will be participating in the future forum of this type. A region must be more dynamic. A region must be more ambitious. The world is moving very fast and we have to move at least with that, uh, with all dynamism which our region has, uh, we have to look into the numbers. And uh, the common joint GDP of all five Central Asian countries is less than GDP of one tiny country as Singapore. So we have to look into this case as a potential for the growth there's a lot of things which we can deliver. There is a, a lot of natural resources, huge, huge ca uh, human capital, which is still under use. Kyrgyz Republic building open country. Our goal is to build competitive environment in politics and economy, in building society. And uh, we, one single, Priority for us in that respect would be to strengthen regional cooperation. Kyrgyz Republic rich with mineral resources, only proven gold reservoirs, reserves contains of more than 1,000 tons of gold. Country rich with hydro energy, and our goal in the coming years is to invest to infrastructure to create favorable investment climate in order to build our economy. Last year, Kyrgyz Republic became the transit country for the region, first time in many years by building two highways to China. Now, country became transit. We have to look into the geographic reality and our great neighbor, which is China, is bringing a lot of opportunities for the region. That is why we try to link Chinese routes to the former Soviet Union countries 
to make our country transit. We opening open sky policy in aviation. Last year, we abolished visa for citizens of 44 countries. With that, the visa-free regime now extended to almost 70 countries around the world. In a division of labor in the region, Kyrgyz Republic de facto became the trade hub of Central Asia. The only direct import from China to Kyrgyzstan consists of $10 billion, which is more than country's GDP, which is a unique situation. That is why we are already feeling the benefits of regional trade. We will be entering customs union with Kazakhstan, Russia, and Belarus. With that, goods produced in Kyrgyzstan will get access to a much bigger and much stronger market. We lived in we live in the most dynamically developing part of the world. We live in a neighborhood of three BRIC countries, which will be locomotives of developing of the world economy. And our region, de facto, should be benefiting out of this development. However, regional cooperation should be indeed, how, as President Aliyev mentioned today, should be the priority for development of our region. If Marco Polo would be traveling this, these days through the region, he would be slower than in his years. We have difficult borders. We have problems with uh, documentation. And this is, of course, not natural. Uh, we cannot stand without development, and we will develop it. Let's do it together. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. May I now call on Minister Yildas, the Minister of Energy and Natural Resources of Turkey. Azerbaijan Devlet Başkanı Sayın Aliyev, değerli katılımcılar, hanımefendiler, beyefendiler, ben de hepinizi Türkiye Cumhuriyet Hükümeti adına saygıyla, sevgiyle selamlayarak sözlerime başlamak istiyorum. Öncelikle hürmetli prezidentin ve sayın Şivap'ın bu organizasyonu için, misafirperverlikleri için teşekkür ediyorum. Bakü'ye yakışır, Azerbaycan'a yakışır bir organizasyon gerçekleşmiş. Tabii önemli bir iş birlikleri fırsatlarını konuşuyoruz. <gülüyor> Uluslararası ilişkilerden arındırılamayacak kadar olan büyük projelerin bir genel analizini yapmak ihtiyacı vardır. Ekonomiler globalleşiyor ama politikalar ulusallaşıyor. Ülkeler ulusallaşan politikalarını bir araya getirdiği kadar işbirlikleri yapabiliyorlar. Ve global krizin enerji sektörüyle alakalı çok tabi sonuçları var. Bunlardan bir tanesi o ülkeler içerisindeki subvansiyonlar enerji sektörünün subvans edilmesiyle alakalı rakamlar gittikçe küçülüyor. Bu aynı zamanda Türkiye Cumhuriyeti gibi büyürken değişen hatta değişirken büyümeye çalışan ülkeler için son derece daha önemli oluyor. Türkiye son 10 yıl içerisinde gayri safi yurt içi hastalığını 3 katına çıkarttı. Enerji sektörüyle alakalı yapılanmasını tam 2 katına çıkarttı. Ve doğru yaptığı kadar güçlendi. Her ülke için geçerli olan bu kaydı kendisine uyguladı. Ve birçok ülkeyle birçok projeyi geliştirme imkanına sahip oldu. O yüzden siyasi istikrarını sürdürülebilir hale getiren ülkelerle beraber bölge güçleniyor. Ve enerjiyi barışın gerekçesi olarak kullandığımız kadar ilerleyebiliyoruz. 
Bugün Türkiye Karadeniz'de Rusya Federasyonu'yla güney akım geliştirirken dost ve kardeş ülke, iki ülke Azerbaycan'la TANAP'ı geliştiriyor. Siyasi yorumlardan uzak bir şekilde İran'la doğalgaz anlaşması yapıyor ve Irak'ta da petrol ve doğalgazla alakalı işbirliğini sürdürüyor. Biz şu anda Suriye'deki rejimi tasfiye etmiyoruz ama ihtiyaçlar olması halinde elektrik temin ediyoruz. Güney Kıbrıs Rum yönetimi ile alakalı oradaki iradeyi tasfiye etmiyoruz ama ihtiyaçlar olması halinde yine elektrik veriyoruz. Bizim şu anda bölgeye olan katkımızın sürdürülebilir siyasi istikrarla beraber daha da arttığını görüyoruz. <gülüyor> Ve Türkiye özellikle coğrafyasından kaynaklanan avantajları da kullanarak çok ciddi projeler geliştirmek için pozitif tutumunu devam ettirecek. Bakü Tiflis Ceyhan Ham Petrol Boru Hattı ile beraber Hazar'daki petrol kaynaklarını dünya piyasalarına açmasına katkı koyuyor. Ve Sayın Başkan'ın bahsettiği gibi demiryolu projesiyle beraber de ulaşımın bir garantisi haline geliyor. Bizler tüketim noktaları olan Avrupa ile üretim noktaları olan Asya arasında ciddi bir köprüyüz. Hiçbir şekilde coğrafyasından kaynaklanan bu avantajları istismar etmeden Türkiye bütün pozitif tutumlarıyla beraber bölgenin kalkınmasına katkı koymaya devam edecek. Ve Türkiye bu değişimi yaşarken 2023 yılı 2030 yılı hedeflerinde son derece gerçekçi görüyor. Bir yandan yenilenebilir enerji kaynaklarıyla kendi ihtiyaçlarını karşılamaya gayret ederken dünyanın uluslararası enerji ajansının verilerine göre hala üç temel yakıt olan petrol, doğalgaz ve kömürle alakalı da tedariklerine devam ediyor. Bir ülkenin üretici ülkelerde özellikle enerji sektöründen diğer sektörlere sermaye kayarken Türkiye'de bu yerli kaynaklara sahip olmayan petrol ve doğalgaz kaynaklarına sahip olmayan Türkiye'de ise diğer sektörlerden enerji sektörüne finansman kayıyor. Ülkelerin özellikle içinde bulunduğumuz coğrafyada büyüme hedefleri o ülkenin geliştirdiği tasarruf miktarlarından daha büyük. Yani iç sermayeden daha ziyade Uluslararası sermayenin gerekliği bu açıdan önemli. Uluslararası sermaye her zaman olduğu gibi istikrarı sever, zemini sağlam ülkeleri sever, hukuku sağlam ülkeleri sever. O yüzden Türkiye bütün bu dengeleri, bütün bu yapılanmaları dikkat alarak büyümesine devam ediyor. Bizler Dünya Ekonomik Forumu'nun İstanbul Bacağı için bütün konuklarımızı davet ediyoruz. Bütün bu salonda bulunan arkadaşlarımızı davet ediyoruz. Ve ben ev sahipliğinden dolayı Sayın Hürmetli Prezident Aliyev başta olmak üzere bütün katılımcılara teşekkür ediyorum. Thank you very much, Minister Yildiz. Now let's uh, hear from the audience, and um, <coughs> I may call first on Professor uh, Victor Halberstadt, who has been a long-term advisor of many companies and uh, governments. And Victor, um, I would suggest since um, um, Andre Kostin mentioned also the European Union uh, as an important neighbor and interested party of uh, the region uh, to, to um, provide us with new views uh, in addition to your reaction um, <coughs> of the future relationship of the European Union, the potential this region represents for the European Union. 
Thank you, uh, Klaus. Uh, that's very kind. Um, I thought I would be one day without European Union. Um, uh, thank you, Andre. Um, um, frankly, as I said to you uh, last night at dinner, Mr. President, uh, we are going through some uh, difficult times and uh, um, when you go through difficult times within a family, you usually do not want to discuss that in a room like this. Um, so let me first uh, uh, react to what I have heard uh, um, uh, this morning. Um, uh, in fact, I'm stunned. I'm, I'm, I was looking at the numbers over the past few weeks preparing this meeting. I was listening to you, Mr. President, last night. I was hearing to the distinguished excellencies talking about the achievements in the region. And then I had a flashback looking at the, uh, at the title of this event. And Klaus, you may have the similar uh, flashback. It says, it's a dialogue on the future of the South Caucasus in Central Asia, and included is Turkey and all these, uh, and, and Russia, of course, and other nations. And I, my flashback is to 20 years ago. I don't know the exact year, but I think it's 20 years ago that we had a World Economic Forum meeting in Istanbul, um, um, which was really the first effort to try to include not only talking about Turkey, Minasiyildiz, but talking about the larger region. And in fact, people looked at us as if it was uh, kind of strange uh, that we were trying to look at the integration of the larger region and the potential for cooperation in this, in this region. And I'm, uh, I'm uh, very pleasantly surprised to hear that all of you now find this an entirely normal uh, um, template, so to say, to, uh, to, uh, to think about the issues going forward. Uh, I remember what I said in that discussion in Istanbul, which was basically, uh, uh, I felt that Turkey was a gateway to Europe for the Asians and that, uh, uh, um, uh, that Turkey, Istanbul, was also a gateway for the Europeans. Today, I would enlarge that concept and say where we are here in the uh, South Caucasus, Central Asia, this is the gateway both for the Europeans and for the, uh, for the, uh, for the Asians. Now, um, I have two questions, one for the medium term and one for the long term. Um, and they were touched upon both by President uh, Aliyev and by, by Minister Kosten. The, there's a real issue of the risk profile of this region, of the individual countries and of the risk profile. Um, you referred, Mr. President, to transformation to the non-oil GDP, so to say, in, to, to use a short term. Um, now, leaving aside the global economy and what may happen in the global economy, slow down or, or a pickup of growth in the next few years, and leaving aside price fluctuations for commodities, especially for energy commodities, what are the specifics of the transformation for your country and for the region? I, this question equally applies to the others because there must be specific plans to really dramatically change the oil dependence or the energy dependence of the region uh, because as Andre Kosten rightly said, there's an end to oil and gas or you phrased it slightly different, Andre. So that's my first question. My second one is more about the long term, um, which brings me then, Klaus, to, uh, to, uh, to the European Union also. Um, talking about cooperation in this region, talking about the future, what model are we talking about? What do you have in mind? Is it not important to start talking early on, not deciding, but start talking early on about what kind of integration you are willing to do? what kind of coordination you are willing to engage in, what kind of customs union, what kind of open labor markets, what kind of financial open markets. Um, because eventually, even after you have settled agreements on energy, etc., uh, there needs to be an overall concept and there will be a need to choose. And that, in that choice, for cooperation and integration, you will run into the issue, which brings me to the European Union, 
of sovereignty. How much sovereignty is a nation willing to transfer to further its economic and political and security future? Uh, obviously, that is the question which the European countries, the European Union member states are, are struggling with. And to end on an optimistic note, we are struggling with it because we really want to achieve that integration. And the struggle is between, it's about the model of integration, the struggle is about the degree of sovereignty which we want to transfer, but the, degree, but the struggle is not about the question that further integration and further coordination and further sovereignty are necessary conditions for the well-being of these nations going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Victor, and I'm sure that uh, we would all like to hear uh, President Aliyev's uh, first opinion about it. Just coming back to Europe, um, um, I, I published just three months ago a small <laughs> booklet uh, which is entitled The Renaissance of Europe. So you may see my own, um, let's say, uh, opinion about the future of Europe. You may download it. I'm, I'm not going into it. Um, I think we are all interested now to hear the president to answer the questions of uh, Victor Halberstadt. But you may download it from, our, from um, the World Economic Forum's website. Mr. President. I'd like to say once again that for our government, diversification is a number one priority for at least last 10 years. Because in the beginning of independence, in order to attract investments, we needed to present our energy potential. We needed to create uh, very preferable conditions for investors to feel themselves comfortably in Azerbaijan. But we clearly realize that only uh, energy sector development will not allow us to transform and will not uh, create uh, you know, jobs and because energy sector does not create a lot of jobs and will not allow us to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. Therefore, we adopted two regional development programs in 2004 and in 2009, the main objective of which was diversification and investments in infrastructure and stimulation of the private sector. Of course, the regulations, the liberal reforms, and the uh, investment climate helped us to achieve this uh, goal. And I can tell you that uh, one of the uh, best statistic data about Azerbaijan is reduction of poverty, reduction of unemployment, and increase of the non-energy sector, which we had last year, for instance, close to 10% growth. And in the coming years, diversification process will go, I'm sure, very successfully, because we have a program Azerbaijan 2020, which is a comprehensive, very precise program about what should be done before 2020. And the target is to double non-energy GDP in the coming eight, nine years. Uh, the sectors which we concentrate, as I said, is uh, information communication technologies, also agriculture, services, and uh, reduction of dependence on energy factor is one of the priorities. At the same time, we clearly understand that energy factor will dominate not only economic development of Azerbaijan, but also regional cooperation in here, because this is a driving force. Coming to the second point with respect to integration and uh, how it correlates with sovereignty, of course, at this panel we have representatives of the countries which have uh, their own choice of development. We have, of course, European Union as an example of integration. Uh, we have now customs union, which some countries are members of. And also there are countries which are now in the process of evaluation and assessment of the future integration plans. As far as the balance between integration and sovereignty is concerned, as far as Azerbaijan is concerned, uh, for us, uh, sovereignty is uh, undisputed substance. It's 100% sovereignty 
this is a must. And probably this comes from our past because for centuries Azerbaijan was part of empires, countries, and only 21 years of independence. Therefore, for us, independence, political and economic, is a prerequisite for future development. And look at the today's Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan, which was, say, 30, 40, or 50 years ago. It's day and night. Therefore, independence brought not only the feeling of national dignity and pride, but also day-to-day -day improvement in the living conditions of the country. But that does not mean that we would prefer just to observe what's happening around us. No, we are participating actively in the regional cooperation projects. We initiate most of the regional cooperation projects and we see the benefits. Therefore, I think there are the boundaries for cooperation which do not cross these boundaries towards reduction of sovereignty or granting part of your economic sovereignty to some uh, unions or some structures which are above you know, the state level. And I think that we managed to find a proper balance between regional cooperation, integration, and of course, sovereignty and protecting our own choice. Is there any of the panel members who would like to comment? Minister? Tabi, hangi modelle ve hangi koordinasyonda bunu sağlayabiliriz dendi. Üreticiler yapılan uluslararası toplantılarda tüketim ülkelerinin projeksiyonlarını zamanda vermemekle tüketiciler de üretici ülkeler için genelde yatırımlarını zamanda yapmamakla dolaylı olarak itham ederler. Bu zıtların buluşturulduğu kadar bu projeler gerçekleşiyor. Nasıl hayatın yanında ölüm var? Ölüm olduğu için hayat değerliyse tüketiciler ve üreticiler birbirinin gerekçesi oluyorlar. Türkiye bunu kavradığı ve bunu bildiği için bu iki yapıyı birleştirmede pozitif tutumunu devam ettiriyor. Bizler yalnızca ülkelerimiz olarak değil, bölge olarak da doğru da davrandığımız kadar bu projeler gerçekleşebilecek. O yüzden üreticilerin ve tüketicilerin birbirini ikna ettiği kadar, ortak noktada buluştuğu kadar bu koordinasyon sağlanmış oluyor. Peki hangi AB ülkesi özellikle bu mücadeleyi veriyor veya kazanıyor? Bildiğiniz gibi genel geçer bir kural vardır. Enerji zaman zaman o ülkelerin siyasetine yüktür. Zaman zaman da o ülkelerin siyaseti enerji sektörü üzerine bir yüktür. Avrupa Birliği'nde belli maksatlarla ve ekonomik işbirlikleri gerekçesiyle bir araya gelmiş olan ülkeler ulusal enerji projelerini, politikalarını geliştirirken çok farklı davranabiliyorlar. O yüzden çok farklı ülkelerle projeler geliştirebiliyorlar. Avrupa Birliği'nin bu manada bir bütün refleksi olsaydı Nabucco projesi çok daha önceden hayat bulurdu. Bu istekler tam buluşmadığı için iki kardeş ülke Azerbaycan'la Türkiye TANAP'ı gerçekleştirerek Avrupa Birliği üyesi ülkelerin doğal gazdaki az güvenliği ile alakalı probleminin çözümünü bir parçası olmak kadar bunları geliştirdi. Bunu birçok projede yapabiliyor olmamız lazım ve yaptığımız kadar da başarılı olacağımıza inanıyorum. Andre, you wanted to comment? Just a few words, I think, uh, on the uh, policy of oil proceeds and diversification. I think Azerbaijan has a very reasonable approach. You know, there are some countries in the world who are just saving for next generations. I don't think that we're so pessimistic approach. It means that we believe that future generations will be living much worse than us. There's other countries 
who are spending a lot, you know, building uh, luxury things like air conditions, uh, football stadiums, or some other things, which is practically useless today. So I think Azerbaijan has a, a practical approach in actually saving enough to provide macro st macroeconomic stability and investing in the future, which also uh, provide the diversification for the future. I think that the only approach which each oil um, uh, exporter should follow nowadays, and I hope Russia also uh, will be do is doing the same. Now, as an integration, I think we're talking about a, a quite initial stage of integration. I don't at the moment see feasible there's some high level of integration with a, a lot of uh, political or other sovereignty uh, to be delegated to some common uh, bodies uh, like we have in Europe or some others. Uh, so, but we were talking about, about the certain initial stage, about particularly um, more integration in trade, uh, in investment, uh, maybe in the financial sector. That's, I think, which is uh, needed uh, for, for the region. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would like to, to, to follow up this question of sovereignty and um, interdependence and necessary structures to, to, to govern interdependence. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Спасибо. Ну, опять же, наверное, там из двух частей диверсификация, интеграция. Поэтому я начну с диверсификации. Я в своем выступлении говорил, насколько важна для нашей страны диверсификация, и преднамеренно ушел от темы нефтянки, да? Вы сами прекрасно понимаете, что Казахстан очень богат нефтяными ресурсами. И тем более в скором времени начинается добыча на Кашагане, и эта доля будет еще больше увеличиваться. И поэтому для нас очень важная тема диверсификации. Поэтому вот господин Костин сейчас говорил о накоплении. Казахстан тоже, я с вами выступлю, Казахстан тоже накапливает, но в то же время накапливая, мы направляем свои средства именно на те проекты, которые сегодня необходимы именно для диверсификации. Во время кризиса 8-9 годов мы вложили в банковский сектор 10 миллиардов долларов для того, чтобы их вытащить, потому что фондирование банков со стороны европейских банков уже отсутствовало. И надо было поддерживать экономики, надо было вытаскивать и надо было вкладывать в экономики. И эта процедура сейчас продолжается. В этой связи мы, помимо того, что я говорил о том, что мы приняли программу индустриализации экономики, сейчас работает программа поддержки малого и среднего бизнеса до 2020 года. То есть, как только перестали поступать дешевые деньги, ну, я, наверное, думаю, что это характерно для всех стран СНГ, финансирование для кредитования для бизнеса очень дорогое, и мы начали субсидировать малый и средний бизнес и до того уровня, чтобы они могли вкладывать э, в экономику. И поэтому э, здесь в этом вопросе мы э, движемся на наш взгляд, что мы на правильном пути. Ну, касательно ну, вторая часть интеграции или суверенитет, ну, надо понимать, наверное, когда мы говорим об интеграции, мы сразу же повышаем вопрос, а сколько мы суверенитета, наверное, теряем. Да? Но поэтому или мы тогда не говорим, что это интеграция. И поэтому сейчас вот был вопрос относительно таможенного союза, да, Казахстан находится в таможенном союзе, и мы говорим о том, что мы не являемся, не идем к союзу, мы идем к экономическому пространству. Только по прошлому году Казахстан, например, никогда не производил электронику и в таком большом количестве никуда не поставлял. Вы знаете, там территория огромная, а рынок очень маленький. Простой пример, только по прошлому году мы в Россию поставили 300 тысяч телевизоров. Вот, вот такого у нас еще не было. То есть э, рынок открылся для нас, и мы начали поднимать уже те отрасли, которые э, не характерны для, было для Казахстана. Поэтому мы именно приверженцы такого рода интеграции, и мы э, не считаем, что когда вот таким образом мы интегрируемся, мы э, что-то э, теряем. Наверное, там где-то что-то есть, но мы больше, наверное, приобретаем. Спасибо. Deputy Prime Minister Topayev. Uh, just uh, a little remarks about uh, integration, sovereignty, uh, as well as uh, way forward. Um, unfortunately, uh, very often we meet uh, our colleagues uh, from the region in Washington, in Brussels, elsewhere, to talk to each other. Uh, that is why the fora like that, when we meet in the region, when we see a lot of people which are interesting in the region, extremely important. 
Indeed, Baku, Astana, Almaty, Bishkek could be very important places where we can meet again. In that respect, uh, we can think on how to institutionalize very interesting process which we face in today and how to make a regular uh, meeting of the type which we're facing now with intellectuals, business elite, politicians to be in one room and to speak honestly to each other. Through this process, we believe we will build better understanding. A lot of uh, concerns uh, will be smoothed away. And uh, maybe as a result of today's meeting, we can think of the way forward, what we have to do together in order to make our region more integrated. Deputy Prime Ministers, I, I just can, on behalf of the forum, um, um, express the views that uh, this should be a starting point. And we always feel uh, the first step uh, to create cooperation is dialogue. And we start the dialogue uh, very much today. Now, how we conduct the dialogue, I would like to, to ask um, uh, Berger Brende, but before doing so, I would like to do two things. Uh, first, I would like to ask Mr. Carr, Professor Carr, just in one minute or two minutes, um, to react to this issue of do we need structures in order to uh, guarantee cooperation? I'm no expert to speak on this question, and the the problem is, we're talking about a region which hasn't existed as a region for hundreds of years. So there are no experts. Everyone's feeling their way. And, and there are no clear answers to these questions. But what Deputy Minister Atarbayev said is extremely important, it seems to me, that there be vehicles for the region as a whole to communicate with itself. Now, there is a question of who is the region, and I think that needs some clarity. Certainly, the three sovereign states of the Caucasus constitute a, if you will, region within a region. Certainly, the five former republics of the USSR constitute a region within the region. But I would add Afghanistan, which for 2,000 years has been intimately part of, this, of these regions, interacting with them and tied with them economically and culturally in so many ways. So first, there's the question of who. Second is the question of who else. I would submit that we are rich in organizations that enable states of this region alone and together to communicate with others and impoverished in organizations in which just the states of the region exist. Within Central Asia in the 1990s, there was the Central Asia Union. It was a surprisingly successful, constructive enterprise. Uh, if you check the history of it, I'm not going to go into it here, it was closed down. And submerged in another entity that we have discussed this morning. I'm not sure that that obviated the need for a platform of discussion within Central Asia, including Afghanistan, alone, and between them and the states of the Caucasus. So I, I, this need not be a state-based or operation, it can be government and business, or business and government. But the need for internal dialogue without the external powers, all external powers, including without the United States, without China, without Russia, without India, without Europe, let them speak among themselves and come to their own views, and then let them talk with the external forces. Thank you, Thank you Professor Carr. 
Um, President Aliyev, we come to the conclusion. If you would summarize in one minute, what is the most important message coming out of this session for you? I think that one of the most important uh, message should be that uh, we all need cooperation and predictability in the region. And we need stability and uh, we need to expand our economic and political ties because we are interrelated. Not only because we lived in one country for many decades, but because uh, the development of our region of Central Asia Caucasus, successful development can be only in close cooperation. And it's not just words, and we uh, already did quite a lot in order to develop regional cooperation projects. For instance, as far as Azerbaijan is concerned, energy, transportation, and uh, relations uh, in trade area helped us to, to develop. Without regional cooperation, we wouldn't have been able to export our hydrocarbons. Without close regional cooperation, we wouldn't have been able to become a transit country for uh, our neighbors and uh, friends across the Caspian. So regional cooperation must be strengthened, and each country should determine uh, the level of cooperation and integration itself. And I think that there should not be a confrontation between integration and cooperation. If each country determines for itself the level of how uh, much it wants to be integrated and participate in various structures, and uh, others would, uh, you know, uh, recognize its right, I think then we will have good progress. Thank you, President. Thank you, distinguished members of the panel. May I now ask my colleague, um, Borge Brende, Managing Director of the World Economic Forum, to enlighten us about the next uh, hours which we will spend together. Thank you, uh, Professor Schwab, uh, Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's not so easy to enlighten uh, after such a very distinguished panel, um, also then sharing uh, directions and also offering visions for enhanced economic cooperation in such a very important region. And uh, we all uh, watched the film at the beginning where we saw that uh, the scope uh, is huge with uh, increased trade, and economic cooperation, we can increase the GDP in the region by 100% in 10 years. And I think also the Deputy uh, Prime Minister of uh, Kyrgyzstan laid out the vision with referring to Marco Polo. If he had traveled uh, today along uh, the Silk Road, there would be more bureaucracy and uh, difficulties when it comes to passing borders and, and doing trade than it was um, years ago. So we will take a very practical look at uh, and a strategic one on how we can enhance cooperation and uh, also deepen uh, economic uh, cooperation in the region in the coming hours. So at 11 o'clock, we will start uh, and continue uh, the strategic dialogue in four different breakout groups. All our distinguished participants can then choose the relevant group for you. We will have entrepreneurship and human capital as one group. We will have energy and natural resources as another one. We will also have trade and supply chains as the third one, and also long-term long investments as the fourth. All these breakout groups are off the record, so no tweeting. They are based on Chatham House rules. We will have a luncheon next door that is based on uh, uh, the host country, Azerbaijan. We know that Azerbaijan is strategically located as a bridge between South Caucasus and also Central Asia, historically and geographically. We'll uh, elaborate on that. In the afternoon, after the morning breakout groups, where we look at the challenges and opportunities, 
already have done so, but there are great challenges and opportunities. In the afternoon, we will have more a look at how to walk the talk. What are um, the real action points needed to enhance economic integration? At five o'clock, we will all gather here again and then share the action points, but also the challenges and opportunities and the outcomes of today's discussions. And then later on, we will have a dinner uh, with the presence, uh, in the presence of, of the president and all uh, the public figures, prime ministers, uh, uh, vice prime ministers and, and, and ministers, where we will then elaborate and also look how can we make sure that this is a real start of a real process. Because what the World Economic Forum is inviting to her is to develop real scenarios to until 2030 when it comes to making sure that we see this integration uh, and enhanced cooperation taking place uh, in the region. So we'll all have a very exciting day. It's gonna be hard work, but uh, I think uh, also the price uh, is there. It is increased uh, collaboration and economic growth and prosperity in the region. So a lot is at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Berge. And on behalf of all the participants, I would like to thank you, Mr. President, again for the hospitality, for making this um, hopefully important process uh, possible and um, the distinguished panelists uh, for having shared with us their views. So I wish you a very good day and thank you again very much.